Amen. Well, preschoolers, you are dismissed, those going to the preschool class. And, uh, and Joni, you knew we were preaching through Daniel 11 and 12, right? No, I'm just kidding. I did tell Joni to read that passage of Scripture, but we're not going back to Daniel 2, but we are summarizing and, and we're finishing our, our series in Daniel this morning, and so I wanted you to hear those really important verses from Daniel 2. Uh, but go ahead, and, and if you have a Bible with you, open up your Bibles with me for the last time uh, to the book of Daniel. And hopefully, hopefully, I guess, not for the last time ever. I mean, the book of Daniel should still remain in your Bibles. Uh, do not get rid of it. Uh, but this is the last sermon in our series going through the book of Daniel. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to start into our next series going through the Sermon on the Mount. And so if you want to be reading ahead, Matthew, 7, uh, excuse me, Matthew 5 through 7, that's where we are headed uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, for it, it's been in this Daniel series that we've really been learning about the events and visions that came about during Daniel's time in exile in Babylon. And these events and dreams and visions were all leading up to the coming of Christ and the coronation of Christ, the time when the indestructible kingdom of God would break into this world, would become what would be the stone that would turn into a mountain that would fill the whole earth. And now in a couple of weeks, when we start going through the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to be looking at how Jesus instructed us to live now as citizens of the indestructible kingdom of God. So that's where we're headed. We've been preaching on this, this, uh, this series on the indestructible kingdom of God and, and when it was going to break into this world and how that came about through the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And now our next series is going to be, okay, now as citizens of this indestructible kingdom of God, how then should we live? And so, Lord willing, that's where we're headed in the future in our time of preaching. But as we've been learning in Daniel over the last couple of weeks, the future can sometimes seem scary. The future can sometimes seem confusing. It can sometimes invoke fear in us, can't it? And one of the reasons why it can seem scary or invoke fear in us is because it's a place that none of us have ever been before. The future. None of us have ever been there before. I haven't been there before. You haven't been there before. Now, that's, that's also what makes the future, what, what can make the future so exciting and why it's really never boring to, to follow the Lord in life. It's always exciting to see what's, what's coming next. But, but there's also some anxiety and some, some fear that can be stirred up in us as well when we think about the future. I mean, I mean, think about a time where you've maybe traveled to a place that you've never been before. Probably a mixture of some excitement along with some anxiousness or just, just kind of the unknown. In college, I got the opportunity to go on a, a sports mission trip to Jamaica where we did basketball camps for kids and then we shared the gospel and but all of us who had never been before, uh, we had this kind of normal amount of anxiousness that could arise in our heart, just not knowing what to expect, not knowing what it was going to be like. And so what did we do? Well, we talked to people who had been before. And actually, we had some teammates and classmates that were from Jamaica. And so we could ask them questions as to what it's like and, and how to best pack and how to prepare for the trip. And they could show us on a map of, oh, oh you, you don't want to go to these places. Don't go to this area. That would not be good for you. But you should, you should go to these areas. And what a comforting thing it was to do when, when traveling to a place you've never been before to talk to someone who's been there. So the future, it can seem exciting or it can be a scary place depending on who you know and who you've been talking to. And church, what we need to remember is that God is the only one who's gone to the future before. And he knows it like the back of his hand. And get this, he also rules over it as well. And you can talk to him about it. You've never been there before. I've never been there before. But God has. Have you, have you talked to him about it? Because this is what we've been learning in, in Daniel, is that God knows the future, God rules the future, and God has gone before us and behind us into the future. And so as we're, we're finishing out Daniel, 
remember that Daniel chapters 10 through 12 make up this last vision that Daniel receives while he's in exile. God sends, and God sends him this vision in the midst of 21 days of praying and fasting. Okay, so there is a little bit of fear stirring up in Daniel, and what does he do? He gets after it in prayer and fasting. Because what's happened is that his people have been allowed to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the city, but they've met some opposition, they've met resistance, and so he doesn't know what to do. He's an older man at this point. He can't go and build it himself. He hears of the resistance, and he says, hey, this is my part, this is my role. I'm going to get after it in prayer. I'm going to get after it in prayer. And it's in that time that God sends him this vision and he gets a glimpse into this spiritual realm and the warfare that's taking place in the spiritual realm. You remember in Daniel 10, we learned that there is more going on here than our eyes can typically see. There's an unseen realm happening in, the, in our midst. And then as the vision unfolds in Daniel 11, we saw last week that this is one of the most detailed prophecies in the entire Bible. We saw God give Daniel hundreds of years beforehand what was going to take place in the years leading up to the coming of Christ. And while it was prophecy to Daniel, we have the benefit of looking back and seeing that prophecy became history. That God's word came true down to the smallest of details. I mean, God told Daniel of the specific battles and marriages and assassinations that were all going to take place and I attempted to show you last week in some of those historical accounts and how, in fact, all of those did take place just the way God said they would. And the reason, church, why prophecy can become history is because God knows the future, God rules the future, and God has gone before us and behind us into the future. And so this week, as we continue in Daniel 11 and finish Daniel 12, we're going to see that this God who knows the future and rules the future is the God who, through Jesus, delivers his people from every distress. Through Christ, God delivers his people from every distress. He goes before us and behind us and with us into the future to deliver us from every distress. So let's pray, and then we'll jump into God's word together. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you that when we are in a time of distress, that we can cry out to you, and you hear us, and you answer us, and you deliver us. We thank you, Lord, that we can have an excitement about the future, because we know you, and we know that you know the future, and you rule over the future. And so, Lord, I ask that you would calm our fears that we have about the future, that we would be able to entrust the future into your hands. And I ask, Lord, then, that, that you would work in this time as your word goes forth. We ask in Jesus' name that you would keep the enemy or any part of our sinful flesh that wants to believe the lies of the enemy, any deceit that, is, that, we've, been, that we've been hearing or telling ourselves, God. We ask that you would keep that far from us and that your truth would go forth today in a powerful way. We ask that those who are wandering and hungering and thirsting, Lord, that you would fill them with good things. We ask for those in bondage to sin, that you would free them from that. We ask for those hurting and ill and sick and in need of healing, that you would bring healing this morning. And we ask for those that just feel weary from life, that you would restore them and you would strengthen them and you would assure them today. Please help, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, we're picking things up now in Daniel eleven thirty six. Admittedly, I talked about this last week. This is a difficult portion of Scripture to interpret and work our way through. Um, but we're going we're gonna to finish today, and I believe it's been a good thing for us to go through the entire book of Daniel. Now, if you remember from last week, the, the kings and the kingdoms leading up to the coming of Christ, they seem to be going from bad to worse. Okay, it went from the king of the north, which we identified as the Seleucid Empire, warring against the king of the south, the empire of the Ptolemies, and the people of God in Judea kind of being caught in between of these two warring empires. 
But then it progressed from that to Antiochus Epiphanes uh, persecuting the people of God directly and setting up a statue of Zeus in the temple, sacrificing a pig in it, desolating the temple. And so things went from bad to worse. Now people are, are getting directly persecuted by a world leader and ruler. And now we get to verse 36 where it gets now even worse. And most commentators up until verse 36 have been in general agreement as to who and what God is referring to when he gives Daniel this vision. But now in verse 36, opinions start to differ, and we can be charitable with one another as to, as to how we're understanding this. But there are three main views as to who this king is now in verse 36 and what events that the rest of this vision is referring to. Some people think that this is still referring to Antiochus Epiphanes, one of the Seleucid kings who had come up from the Greek empire who committed all these horrible things against the people of God. Some people think it's, it's still talking about him. Others think, and this is probably the most popular view right now in evangelical churches in America, others think that this king is now thousands of years into the future and that from verse 35 to 36, we're not just skipping forward to the next king or kingdom, but now this is referring to a future capital A Antichrist that appears at the end of days that will lead up to all these horrible things leading up to the second coming of Christ. Okay, that's the second view. Whereas others, and this would be where I currently am understanding it, believe that this is now speaking of the Roman Empire. Okay, and the kings of the Roman Empire, the emperors and the Caesars, who were in power when Christ first came into the world, who were in power when Christ was crucified, raised, and ascended into heaven on the throne, and who were in power then later on when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, all under the kings of this next empire, the Roman Empire. I believe that we see consistency in these visions and dreams starting from the beginning of Daniel, what, what Joni just read, how God had sent Daniel ever since Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2, that after Babylon there was going to come the Medo-Persian Empire, and then the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. And so I believe that that's what's happening here uh, as these events are playing out. We don't need to skip ahead thousands of years from verse 35 to 36 we can simply see this as referring to the next king and the next kingdom that came after the Greeks, namely the Romans who were in power when Christ first came into this world. So look with me now at 1136. Uh, and the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. I believe that this is referring to the line of Caesars or the emperors of Rome. I mean, before this time, rulers of nations, they had considered themselves to be gods like this, but the Caesars really took it to a whole new level. In fact, when Caesar Augustus assumed the role of emperor, he was referred to, this was even on some of the coinage, he was referred to as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Now, I don't know if that sounds familiar to you as Christians, those titles, but that was who was in power when Jesus was born. Caesar Augustus, who they called the Son of God and the Savior of the world. But he really wasn't either one of those things, was he? He was a counterfeit. You see, God creates, God has his Savior coming into the world. The enemy loves to counterfeit that and create a false version of that. But don't worry, God will deliver his people through Christ from every distress, even the distress that counterfeit gods and false saviors bring upon his people. Look at verse 37. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women, he shall not pay attention to any other God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now, this could be referring to the, the shift in the Roman Empire when the kings took on the title of Caesar. Uh, there, was more, there, were, there, were, there was a shift from earlier Roman and Greek religion to now more of a focus on military strength and emperor worship. Verse 38. He shall honor the God of fortresses instead of these, a God whom his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts, 
He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. So like we've been seeing with, the, with Persia and with Greece, these nations before the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus had spiritual entities that ruled over them and empowered them who were not obedient to the one true God, Yahweh. And it's likely that the spiritual entity behind the Roman Empire was Satan himself, who wanted to do whatever he could do to keep the kingdom of God from breaking into this world. Verse 40, at the, end of, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen and with many ships, and he shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. Now this is likely describing the battle of Actium. This battle took place in 31 B.C., between the forces of Octavian, who would later become Caesar Augustus, who fought against Mark Antony, the king of the north, and Cleopatra, the famous one. I said last week, uh, I mentioned a non-famous Cleopatra. This would be the famous Cleopatra, who was the queen of the south. Okay, so he, he fought against the king of the north and the king of the south, but Octavian defeated them and extended Roman rule over the land of Israel and even into then Egypt. Look at verse 41. He shall come into the glorious land, that's the land of Israel, and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train." But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. All right, let's pause there for a second. So at this point, it still doesn't look good for the people of God. The Babylonians who ruled over them, they fell, but then the Persians rose to power and ruled over them. The Persians, though, they then fell, but then the Greeks rose to power and ruled over the people of God. Then the Greeks fell, and now the Romans rose to power and ruled over them. And the question is, when will their deliverance come? When will their deliverance come? They've got a Roman ruler ruling over them who calls himself the Son of God and the Savior of the world. But when will true deliverance come? And thankfully, this vision is given to Daniel and to the people of God to show them that God will deliver his people from every distress, including these false gods and including these false saviors. And so if we could pause for a second, and, and I want to ask you, I wonder what false gods or false saviors you still need to be delivered from today. Because here's the thing about false gods and false saviors. In our unbelief, they seem like unconquerable enemies. It's difficult for us to imagine how Jesus could deliver us from some of these. And so for you, maybe this is some sort of addiction. Maybe this is some sort of habitual sin that you're in, that you're caught up in, just a pattern of sin that you confess, but you never really repent and get out of. It's just confess and sin and confess and sin and confess and sin. What is it? What false God, what false Savior have you been looking to other than Jesus to deliver you from your distress? But what's ha what happens with false gods and false saviors is they turn on you and they end up enslaving you. They don't actually free you. Like that's the, that's the deceit. The lie is this false savior, this false God, this false worship is going to free me. But what ends up happening is people actually become enslaved to these things. When you turn to anyone else other than Jesus to deliver you, you end up becoming enslaved to it. And then once you've been enslaved to it and oppressed by it for so long, even for a Christian, some of these things can seem in our minds like the Roman Empire to us. Who in the world 
could overthrow the Roman Empire. That's what the people of God were thinking back then. Now, little did they know that 2,000 years later, you know, the kingdom of God, the church of God would be growing and flourishing, and the Roman Empire would be no more. We have the benefit of history to look back and see that. But sometimes these false gods and false, these saviors that we've gone to, other than Jesus, they seem like insurmountable foes to us, like we could never be free from them. And so some of you have just surrendered and given up to these and accepted them as, their, as, as your ruling overlords. But God, through Jesus, wants to deliver you from every distress, even these false gods and false saviors. Or what about this? A false savior could also look like maybe a person or a politician or a parent or a spouse or a friend. It can look like someone that you've looked to to deliver you from a distress other than Jesus. They've been your false savior. Maybe your spouse was your false savior. You thought by marrying them, depending upon them, that they were going to rescue you from all, all distress. And now you're frustrated with how they haven't been able to deliver you like you hoped they would. And they're weary of, of living under this crushing burden and weight that you have put on them because it's a burden only Christ can carry. So who have you been looking to before Jesus to deliver you from every distress? Isn't it interesting that when we find ourselves in a time of distress, we'll, we'll call out and cry out to any other God, person, or thing before Jesus. Like, we'll try anything. We, we hear it's like a, a, a snapshot commercial on YouTube about a quick fix for something. We'll try it. We'll try anything and everything before we'll call out to Jesus. But what would happen if we cried out to Jesus? What would happen if we cried out to Jesus? You've got several people in the room who could testify as to what happens when you cry out to Jesus. Daniel, in this vision, he sees that the nations are raging. He sees that the nations are going to continue to rage for some time. But when will the true king come and inaugurate his kingdom? Well, remember what we learned back in Daniel 2.44. This is, again, what, what, some of what uh, Joni read. I'll remind you in case you forgot. This was little King Nebi's dream, which is one of my favorite parts of the sermon series. It seemed like that nickname stuck with some of you, little King Nebi for Nebuchadnezzar. He has this dream about the statue of the four empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, then Rome. And then God said in Daniel 2.44, speaking of the kings of Rome, he says, And in the days of those kings, in the days of the kings of Rome, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Church, this is what happened through Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. The kingdom of God was set up. Now, like we say here often, it's an already not yet kingdom. Meaning that it's already here, it's already set up, but it's not yet fully realized. And it won't be until the return of Christ. It's still in the process of breaking into pieces all these other kingdoms and bringing them to an end. And so here's what we need to learn about being delivered from distress. And that is that right now we live in, a, in this tension of the kingdom being already here but not yet fully realized. And therefore, as ones who live in the tension of that kingdom... God does not tell us that we will live distress-free lives. He doesn't promise us that. No, in fact, he promises us the opposite of that. There will be times of trouble. There will be times of distress in this life. Plenty of distress is still to come for you. I, I, I don't like being the bearer of bad news, but, but there's even better news to come. But, but plenty of distress is still to come in your future. But according to God's steadfast love, demonstrated through Jesus, he promises to deliver us from every distress. So now, in chapter 12, I believe we skip some years ahead. Now, some people, again, think we skip thousands of years ahead to the very end of time. But I think this skips ahead now to the time that the Romans are still ruling, 
but Jesus has already lived, died, and was raised and ascended into heaven. And even though Jesus is now on the throne in heaven, there is still a time of trouble and distress that comes upon the people of God, namely the Jewish-Roman war and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Okay, so look at Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. Again, another reference to an angelic entity overseeing a nation. Michael was the angel in charge of the people of God. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been uh, since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, every one whose name shall be found written in the book. I believe that this time of trouble is referring to the three and a half year tribulation that was experienced in Jerusalem in the Jewish Roman War leading up to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And what we know from God's word and then from historians is that Jesus gave his disciples some instructions as to what to do when this time of trouble would come upon them. Okay? Because we know through Jesus, God delivers his people from every distress. So Jesus in Mark 13, we'll have this Mark 13, 14 up on the screen. I believe that this is referring to this time in Daniel 12. Jesus said, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those, one of the more humorous things I think written in scripture, let the reader understand. You guys figure that out. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, so let's leave that up on the screen for a second. To give you some context, Jesus here is answering his disciples' question as to when will the temple be destroyed and what will be the sign that this is about to happen. And so many believe that Jesus is referencing what's about to happen in the year 70 AD because about 40 years after Jesus spoke those words, the Roman general Titus will come into Jerusalem to put down a Jewish uprising and destroy the temple and destroy the city. And the Jewish historian Josephus, who was there, believed the conquest of Titus was the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy as well as the prophecy of Jesus. Because what Titus did was while in the city of Jerusalem, while it was burning, he brought images of Caesar into the temple and made sacrifices to the Caesars, which absolutely would have qualified as an abomination that causes desolation in the temple. During those years when the Romans were laying siege to Jerusalem, it was a horrific time. It could be described as a great tribulation. The Romans cut off food supply. They didn't allow anyone in or out of the city at many times. They burned the food storehouses in Jerusalem. They intentionally polluted the drinking water. People were starving to death and resorting to cannibalism, even eating some of their family members. The Romans were crucifying people as quickly as they could, approximately 500 crucifixions each day. Josephus wrote that the noise from the fighting was continually heard, but the noise from people lamenting and mourning and crying exceeded the noise of the fighting. This was a horrific time. People groaned and moaned and cried continually. If you were there, it would no question have been to you a great tribulation. And Jesus in Mark 13 is trying to tell his disciples it's going to be painful. The destruction of the temple will be painful. Jesus knows the future. He rules over the future. But he, he will deliver them from every distress. And so look how gracious Jesus is. He preserves his people by giving them a plan of escape. So, so now in Luke 21, in Luke 21, this is Luke's account of this same Olivet Discourse, we see that Jesus says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. Now understand this, conventional wisdom back in that time would have said when an army is coming, run to the fortified city. Run into the walls for protection. And so this is, if Jesus hadn't given his people instructions, this is what would have happened. The Romans are coming, and if you didn't know what Jesus had said, you would have run into the city walls. But Jesus, in order to preserve his people, 
had a plan for them to escape the coming judgment that was coming upon Jerusalem. And he said, no, when you see the armies coming, don't run into the city. He said, flee to the mountains. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. We know from history, late in the year, A.D. 66, the Christian community in Jerusalem, under the leadership of a cousin of Jesus, withdrew to the village of Pella in Perea, a mountainous region on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Historians say that the Roman commander, Crestius, had had surrounded the city, but then inexplicably and without warning ordered his troops to withdraw temporarily. And this allowed the Christians then in Jerusalem to escape before the tribulation really got bad. According to the historian of the ancient church, Eusebius, it was when the Roman armies temporarily withdrew that the believers remembered the warning of Jesus and fled the city. He writes, Moreover, the people of the church at Jerusalem, in accordance with a certain oracle that was vouchsafed by way of revelation to the approved men there, the oracle, some of which we just read, had been commanded to depart from the city before the war and to inhabit a certain city of Perea. They called it Pella. And when those who believed in Christ had removed from Jerusalem, as if holy men had utterly deserted both the royal metropolis of the Jews itself and the whole land of Judea, the justice of God then visited upon them all their acts of violence to Christ and his apostles by destroying that generation of wicked persons, root and branch, from among men. So this was a time of trouble. And yet through Christ through people listening to Jesus' words, through them trusting his words, through them obeying his words, God's people were delivered. God's true people were delivered. And as Daniel 12 verse 1 says, at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Now look with me at verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, admittedly, if you hold to the position that these are all events that take place at the very end of time and not just the end of the temple age or the old covenant period, verse 2 should be your verse that you take to me and say, aha, Gotcha. Pastor Grant, isn't this speaking of the resurrection? And I would say, of all the verses in Daniel that you could use to convince me that this is a prophecy about the end of time, this would be the one. So touche, if you would take this verse to me to to, to talk. And it's honestly the one I've wrestled with the most since we started the book of Daniel. But in that wrestling, in that trying to understand the book as a whole, I still think the majority of the evidence leads me to believe that these are events that are taking place during the Roman Empire. And that you could understand 12 verse 2 as primarily being about the gospel being preached to people after the resurrection of Christ and the new birth and eternal life that people can start to experience when they come to faith in Christ right away. With, yes, absolutely, a second and fuller fulfillment coming at the end of time. But church, it is in this time, it is when we proclaim the gospel right now, that people can become new creations. That what was dead can become alive. Eternal life can start now when we put our faith in Christ. And so in the first century, as the gospel was going forth, many who slept in the dust, who were dead in their sins... Some were awakened by the gospel and received it and believed it to eternal life, while others rejected it to their shame and everlasting contempt. But the truth of this verse absolutely assures us of the fact that God can deliver us from every distress, even the ultimate distress of death itself. But it's only through faith and Jesus Christ. He's given us a way to escape the coming judgment. He's given us a way for the dead to become alive. And it is through Jesus Christ, 
through Jesus Christ, we can be delivered from times of trouble and tribulation and even from death itself. Let's continue on now in verse 3. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Okay, so he tells Daniel to seal the scroll because uh, from the time that Daniel gets this, it's still going to be at least a few hundred years into the future. So he says, seal the scroll. But then what's interesting, if you're familiar with the book of Revelation, is that then it's the Lamb of God who is the only one worthy to break the seal and open the scroll. And then the prophecy that's given in Revelation, we learn, is not to be sealed because a lot of those events are going to happen very soon in the first century. That's what, that's what it says in Revelation. Revelation 22.10. Uh, Revelation 22.10, it says, And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of this prophecy, of this book, for the time is near. So notice the difference. Daniel, seal it up. This is still a few hundred years at least in the future. When Revelation was given, it says, Do not seal up the words of this one for the time is near. And I believe that verse is true. I believe that, that, that the, the clear portions of Revelation are, are true, for the time is near. And so I do believe that a lot of Revelation was fulfilled in that first century, which is why it wasn't to be sealed up. Um, but that is another conversation and another sermon series for another day, and we will, we will do that someday. Uh, but today will be a good time to finish our apocalyptic literature, and we'll, we'll move on to other things uh, until we someday get to the book of Revelation. Look with me now at verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on the bank of this one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the men clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. I believe that's to be interpreted three and a half years. Time was uh, uh, commonly known as a year, times, two years, half a year. Three and a half years. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Maybe you can relate to Daniel here. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. But the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Again, approximately three and a half years. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at 1,335 days. That's 45 more days after the intense tribulation as there still was some skirmishes and persecution. You still wouldn't want to be in the city of Jerusalem for a time. Verse 13 but go your way till the end, and you shall rest, and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. Okay, we did it. A lot of troubling and distressing things that were just shown to Daniel, but God gives him a final word of personal comfort and assurance. And church, I would like to give you all the same today as well. Because I don't know what the future exactly holds for each and every one of you. I don't know what the, the, the future holds exactly for even this local church. I don't know exactly what all the events are going to happen for the Universal Capital C Church worldwide. But I do know that there will be times of trouble and distress and yet God has given us a final word, namely Jesus, to offer us the comfort and assurance that God will deliver his people from every distress. And so to conclude this sermon and this sermon series, know this, that through Christ, those who are citizens of the indestructible kingdom, 
God will deliver them from every distress. Whether false gods and false saviors, whether times of trouble or tribulation, and even death itself. And that is true whether you believe all this prophecy and apocalyptic writing in Daniel is referring to, to our future and the second coming of Christ, or whether you believe it's all in Daniel's future and the first coming of Christ. That is true whether you think all these events are describing the end of time itself or whether they're describing the end of the old covenant and the ushering in of the new. But I'd like to, to finish this sermon and this series with some words from Psalm 107. And so if you have your Bibles, you can say goodbye to Daniel now for a little bit and turn to Psalm 107. Psalm 107 was what our call to worship was from at the start of our gathering. It's a psalm that focuses, on, focuses in on God's faithfulness and God's steadfast love in delivering his people from various forms of distress. Four times in this psalm, we hear the line, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Repetition is important in God's word. God's making a point here. This is repeated, 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 repeated. It says, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. We see in this psalm four categories of people that he delivers out of their trouble. And maybe you can relate with one of these today. First, in verse 4, we see that he delivers the wanderers. So look with me in your Bibles at Psalm 107, verse 4. It says, Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Church, do you this morning feel like you are starting to wander from God and his ways, that you are starting to wander and look for someone else to deliver you and sustain you and satisfy you other than Jesus. Oh, prone to wander, Lord, we feel it. Prone to leave the God we love. Wanderers, hear this word in verse 6. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them from their distress. God also delivers the prisoners. Delivers the wanderers, but he also delivers the prisoners. Look at verse 10. Some sat in darkness in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help Some of you need to be delivered from your enslavement to sin. You are living like a prisoner. You're not living as a free person in Christ. You're living like a slave to your sinful emotions and passions, to your lusts and to your appetites, to your pride and to your selfishness. And you feel like you'll never be free. It feels like an insurmountable escape. It feels like you have to overthrow the Roman Empire just to experience some freedom. But prisoners, hear this word in verse 13. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Through faith in Jesus Christ, God can deliver the prisoner and set them free. Even if you are a Christian, you can start to become enslaved to sin again. And it's, it's, it's a lie of the enemy that says you'll never be free of it. Because in Christ, you can be free from it. Yes, we celebrate every Sunday Jesus took the penalty for our sin, but he also has released us from the power of sin. We can renounce sin. We can say no to sin and yes to God. But it's the lie of the enemy that keeps us from doing that. And so listen, e even if you're struggling to believe me that you'll ever be free from this one thing or this sin or this addiction, listen, trust me, confess it to God, renounce that sin, call upon the Lord, trust Jesus, call out to Jesus. Jesus. 
The name of Jesus has power in our lives. We're so willing to call upon any other name under heaven except Jesus. Cry out to Jesus and watch him start to take the shackles off of you. Cry out to the Lord. He will free the prisoners. God also delivers the sick and the wounded. Look at verse 17. So he delivers the wanderers. He delivers the prisoners. He delivers the sick and the wounded in verse 17. Some were fools through their sinful ways because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. So whether some of you are experiencing an illness physically or emotionally or spiritually, some of you might be ill just because of just the natural effects of living in this fallen world. Some of you, though, might be sick and in need of healing because of your own folly. Your own folly and sin has gotten you into some things now that you need healed from. And those who need healing hear this word from God in verse 19. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and he healed them and delivered them from their destruction. God can heal the wounding, the hurting, the ill. God can heal. God also delivers those getting tossed about by the storms of life. Look now at verse 23. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Maybe this morning that's how you feel. You feel like you're caught in a storm that you have no control of and no way of getting out of. Life is tossing you back and forth. You feel like you can't get your feet firmly planted underneath you. If that's you, you need to hear this word. All of you who are being tossed about by the storms of life, hear this word in verse 38. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, And he brought them to their desired haven. Church, cry out to the Lord in your your trouble and trust him to deliver you from every distress. Let's pray.